But if you want to cross carriages, you can. You want to go down the back for a sticky? Or you're in the back car at the front for a sticky? You can do just take it slow and steady. When you're moving through the train, hold on to those little handles in the corners of the seats. And when you're crossing the carriages, step over the black and yellow buffers that have written on them, no step. Just step over them. They move around a bit as we go over the bumpy track. Clear left so far. for the next hour and a half anyway. Um, the only other things really that you guys need to know is the blue rope that's up here. If you're in the front carriage and you just join us, you can see that blue rope across those chairs. We're going to pull that down in a minute. The chair directly next to me on my left, the one that Hamish is currently sitting in, that will become available for everyone to sit in, as well as the chair directly behind me. It's also available for everyone to sit in. Try and tell you is five minutes at hand, ask questions, take photos, have a yarn, and then bugger off. Make sure that around every five minutes that is free for someone else to come and have a go if they want. And for those of you who just joined us, any questions you got, please ask. This is a four day, three night trip and you've just joined us halfway through the second day. So there's already a whole bunch of things that Hamish and I have spoken about over the microphone that we're probably not going to go over again. So if there's any of those basic questions, please feel free to ask myself or Hamish at any point. We'll do our best to answer you. But at the moment, leaving Mount Surprise, leaving the Roman country, or no, I shouldn't say leaving the Roman country, or the Roman country, but quite some time, we're just leaving me in surprise. We're coming down the side. Plateau, dropping down a series of levels. Coming down the crossover, a really nice little creek called Junction Creek. As I get closer to the creek, it's a little bit away yet, but as I get closer, I'll try and slow right down. Sneak up to it because we do see a lot of wall on there. John Nethery was saying the other day that the, um, the most recent activity with Undara only happened about 12,000 years ago. So the last time it went, boy, really? And so when you come down this here, you come down off the side of this volcanic rock, some of which are as young as 12,000 years. And then you get to Junction Creek and you come back onto the granite country and it's like 1.8 billion years old. So they go from like yeah, 12,000 years to 1.8 billion. Billion, yeah. Billion. 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 You can't fathom that kind of Nah, that's what I said to him like. He was doing like what he said was good, but he wasn't talking to people as if they didn't know. Like he's kind of expected everyone's gone on the same page. And I had to ask him questions as he was going through it. What's a rift or yeah, what's this what's in a A rift is uh, a good example of that is putting in installing a new young under seasoned publican in a uh, country pub in Mount Surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, that causes a rift. Yes. Yeah. I reckon love can make you feel nauseous. 
Yeah, well, well you make me feel pretty nauseous. Yeah. Well, well, maybe that's just so morning sickness. Maybe you love chicken. Yeah, you love coriander. You love eggs. Sometimes you repel what you want. Yeah, that's right. In, in, you know, it'd be funny to wake up one day and just have that realisation. You know, all this time, all I really wanted was just a nice chicken and coriander sambo. You know? Good feed of chook. And that just fixes every challenge. It's yeah. Just, you wake up and you're in the new bed. You realise that you didn't, you weren't looking for the steam martini stuff. No, it was just chicken all It was chicken, that's what it was. Chicken is finite. Yeah. species of native fish, some freshwater long tom, 
Out on the left and the right hand side, I can see at the moment. Bar Grunter, Archerfish, Freshwater River Prawns, Terrapin. They're a pretty good tune. Sooty Grunter, Rainbow Fish. Plus, you get the red claw in here and the big freshwater river prawns. Cherubin, they're a pretty good chew. source and food source for the Roman people for European settlement. And as a geologist told me like a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was pretty cool, it's a junction creek where we leave the basalt rocks of the Andara lava volcano when it blew up and some of those rocks are as young as 12,000 years old. We come down onto this granite which is about 1.8 billion years old. We come up out of Junction Creek. It's a pretty steep climb up. We've been told it's a 1 in 16. A lot of drivers told us that. 1 in 16 grade getting out of it, which is extremely steep but um with the railway literature we can only find one in 25 written down the boss told us there is a way that we can check it out ourselves using i don't know some kind of mathematic formula but i got expelled from high school so it's not my strong point I'll leave that up to Hamish. Oh, yeah. Going into areas where they never used to be. Oh, 
not that far, like five kilometres from that dam, there's a crocodile farm. Oh, yeah. And it's not great. It's not at the top of its game. Yeah. And um, a lot of crocs get out. So easy chance of getting out. So yeah, we, we hear that on the, when he's speaking all the time about crocodile yeah. population. So he uses that. Yeah, right. But generally, because uh, the salaries get so big, like. Like a mature male, seven, seven, eight hundred kilos up to about twelve hundred. It's huge. And they've got to come out of the water, they've got to bask in the sun and raise their body temperature to about 30 degrees, 32 degrees. And then it's operating at 100% efficiency. But once we get up on top of the range and come inland like these areas, during the summer it could definitely do that. But in the winter time, like no way at all. And so for prolonged periods, like six months every year, if he can't raise his body temperature to that optimal level, it just means that his metabolism isn't running at 100%, his immune system's compromised. They end up with pneumonia and other respiratory issues, cancers, bits and pieces, and just long term, the species doesn't survive. The freshwater crocodile is much smaller, like a big one, 70 kilos, maybe 100's huge. Um, they all live through here, everywhere. But they're much smaller, they can come out early in the morning in the winter, fast, raise that body temperature pretty efficiently and away they go. Yep. There are some areas where salties and freshies will overlap, but the salty will kill the freshie every single time and just use them as food. So if salties lived up here like long term, thrived up here, we just wouldn't have freshwater crocodiles, that wouldn't exist. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, when people get involved and they start doing silly things, crocs get out of farm. There's been quite a few confirmed cases of just cockheads catching a, a little crop like in a crab pot or something and keeping it for a bit, it gets too big and then they let it go on a dam or something. I got interviewed on this podcast about my thoughts on it and 
I said to them, well, cassowary is a great example. So like at the moment, critically endangered. And we're doing our best to protect cassowaries and, and bring their numbers back. But no mistake about it, like, they're dangerous. You know, you know if you're going to pick up a baby cassowary because you think it's cute, that's probably going to disembowel you. Like, at the moment, you can kind of walk into the rainforest whenever you want it. Chances are very, very small. You can see cassowary. If our current conservation efforts are successful, 20, 30 years down the track, we're going to have more cassowaries. At which point, are my kids going to be those older generations saying, give me back my rainforest? I can't walk in there really nearly whenever I want to now with me pig and dogs in a boombox. Well, there's freaking cassowaries. Like. Yeah, it's an interesting question though. Why, why are their numbers down? Uh, habitat destruction mostly. Like, If you've been along the tablelands, I don't know if you've seen it, but a lot of rolling green hills that used to be covered in rainforest, you know, and Europeans turned up just chained and all those and tried to make it look more like home. So that was a big one. Um, just urban development, car strike and dogs. Pigs are pricks too, they get in and eat the nests. Big one. Oh, pigs are everywhere. Yeah. You missed it. And that's one of the issues, like we got two animals in Australia that will actively prey on pigs. One is our like land-based apex predator, the other one's a water-based apex predator, the dingo and the crocodile. Both animals we hate. We trap poison to get rid of. Yeah. And we wonder why pig populations up, yeah. Yeah. up, you know, yeah. Yeah. foxes, cats, goats. Yeah. 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 It's all so, flow on from decisions, isn't it? Yeah. Decisions made. Thanks for your time, Will. No dramas, mate. Cheers, mate. Man, thanks,
most people straight away think it's Queensland Rail. We get people come up, they go, oh, so how long you been working for QR? Or um, do you like working for QR? Do they look after you? Or what other trains did you drive for QR before this one? Or do you think you'll continue to work for QR? Or can you get my grandson a job in QR? We get so many QR questions, it's not funny. And the short answer to all of them is no. We don't work for QR, we never have worked for QR, and personally, at the rate that I slag them off, I'll never get the opportunity to work for QR. So we work for a private company called Cairns Coranda Steam. It is a silly name. It's a name that does not reflect anything that the company does these days. But it gives you a little bit of an idea as to why the company formed in the first place. Cairns Coranda Steam. They wanted to run a steam train from Cairns to Coranda. Now the company got together in about 1998. The primary shareholder is a bloke from New Zealand called Ian Welsh. He's a nice enough fella. I don't know how he made his money in construction or something like that, but he has stupid amounts of money, like a ridiculous amount of money. Some of you guys on the trains, you might like trains, but you don't have the money to own trains, so you have a model train set. Our boss, he just has real trains. That's his model train set. He's got the largest collection, or the largest private collection, of steam locomotives. I can't remember whether it's in the world or just in the southern hemisphere, but anyway, either or, he's got stupid amounts of money. He had a bit of an idea. He really wanted to run the steam train from Cairns to Coranda. He got an old South African steam loco. He sent it over here. And they started the process of being able to run it on the main line from Cairns to Coranda. Now this process isn't like you just fill out a couple of forms and away you go. This was massive. This was the first time that a private company wanted to drive their train on government owned railway. It had never happened in Queensland before this. These days you've got things like Pacific National Freight, they're running all over the place. This was before they existed. So there was no reason why it couldn't be done, but it just meant that there was a hell of a lot of negotiating and flying from New Zealand to Cairns, down to Brisbane for meetings and pre-meetings and post-briefings and get-togethers and phone calls and it went on and on and on for about six years. The whole process took until finally he was given the ticket of approval to run the steam train from Cairns to Korea. He was going to run it for the very first time in March of 2004. But leading up to that, about 2003, our operations manager, he's a local bloke, he couldn't help but notice that the company had really put all of their eggs in one basket with this steam truck. Six years of preparation and negotiations and consulting, six years. If for some reason the steam train doesn't work, the company goes bust and all that work for nothing. So in an attempt to like diversify, our boss couldn't help but notice the Savannah Lander over here. And that the Savannah Lander's contract between Queensland Rail and Department of Transport was about to expire. Now, a lot of people assume that Queensland Rail own the Savannah Lander, they own the Gulf Lander, they own the Spirit of Queensland, the West Lander, the Spirit of the Outback, they own all those trains in suburban Brisbane, but it's, it's not true. They're not the actual organisational government body that owns those things. Department of Transport, Queensland Main Roads. That's the government body that... Queensland Rail 
well as like the side organisation that operates those passenger services and maintains the line on behalf of the Department of Transport. Contracts are drawn up between those two government bodies for all the various rail services and usually they last about five years before they expire. Once they expire, those various contracts go up for tender. They go up on the internet and that is your time to apply for it if you want to. But keeping in mind that it's not as easy as just filling out a couple of forms and away you go. You have to prove that you are an accredited railway operator. That's not an easy thing to do. But if you can do that, if you can address all the criteria, tick all those boxes, you are in for a chance to obtain the next contract for the spirit of Queensland. No one ever does. And by default, Queensland Rail end up with these contracts. They've got to run it for another period. This is what happened with the Savannah Land. The contract. It was going to go up for tender. Operations manager thought, geez, if we apply for that and we got it, that's uh, that's some good money. And if anything happens to the steam train, that Savannah Land contract could keep the company alive. So he got in contact with our big boss over in New Zealand. He said, look, I really think we should do this. Think of it as a bit of a lifeline. And the big boss, not interested at all. He loves steam trains, he's got no time for rail motors, not a rail motor man. But our boss begged and pleaded. The big boss flew over from New Zealand and talked to him about it. And he said, look, before I talk to you about it, I'm going down to Cairns Station. I'm going to find a pamphlet on this train and I'm going to have a look at it. So the big boss here, he went down there, he found a pamphlet, he was standing at Cairns Railway Station reading it. And this woman comes up to him. She says, oh, thinking about taking the Savannah letter, are you? He says, uh, yeah, in a matter of speaking, yes. She said, oh, best trip I've ever been on. And he was pretty blunt. He said, well, I'll make sure I'm authority on train trips and how good they are. And she said, oh, look, I've spent... Siberian Expresses and uh, Blue Trains in Africa and Rocky Mountains, this, that and everything else. And she said, um, well, they're all great. She said, there's something about the Savannah Land that is extremely unique. She said, it's just like stepping back in time to a railway that doesn't exist anymore. It's casual. She walked off, we have no idea who that woman was, but in that one conversation she convinced him to give it a go. So he went back, said to her operations manager, right, take it, do it, fill out your criteria, do your application, whatever you've got to do. So our boss starts addressing that process. Submitted his application and he won. The Savannah Lander and the steam train both left Cairns Station under the operation of Cairns Korean Steam for the very first time on the very same day, the first Wednesday in March 2004. The steam train ran from March till about September. that they had to park it in the 
shit and never turn it back on again. It was an absolute failure. If it wasn't for the Savannah Lander contract, the company would have folded then and there. But because of the Savannah Lander, the company didn't just survive, it thrives off the Savannah Lander. But since 2004, the Savannah Lander contract between Cairns Grand Steam and Department of Transport, it has run out several times. And obviously, we're always extremely eager to throw our hat back in the ring go for it again and so far we've been successful so at the moment we are almost one year into a seven year contract the contract run at the moment should take us right up until 2030 which is pretty good Now the way the contract works is with that application the boss basically has to submit a quote say Department of Transport, this is how much it's going to cost you. Now Hamish and I don't know exactly how much money that is but it's got to be in the millions. Department of Transport says, yeah, no worries, look, there's that money. Don't ask us for anything else. Here's all your money. And you've got to stick to these conditions. So we've got certain conditions we've got to stick to. One of those conditions is the timetable. The Savannah Lander starts the very first week of March and finishes in the very last week of November. We have to operate the train and we have to stick to the timetable per the conditions of the contract. The thing is, like in the very first week of March, that is cyclone season. So is April, so is May. And Amish and I don't have many people on the train at that time of year, if anyone at all. You guys have done a lot of planning to organise this trip. If you were to organise it for March or April, you've got a pretty good chance it's going to be cancelled because a great big filthy cyclone has just moved into the area and the trip's been postponed. So people don't aim for that. What it means is that Hamish and I get trips where we don't have a... As per the contract conditions, we still need to run the trip. And we will go as far as we can. If we can get all the way to Forsyth and back, great. Or we get to Arlington and turn around and go back or Mount Surprise, whatever it is. But we have to stick to the advertised timetable because we are a scheduled passenger service. And if the timetable says, weather permitting, in the first week of March, we leave Almond at 8 a.m. in the morning, that we need to be there just in case someone's standing there, wanting to buy a ticket to catch a train from Almond Inn and Mount Surprise. We have to be there. Rarely does that happen. So Hamish and I will do these entire trips with not a single person on board. And those trips they get pretty interesting, eh? Oh, you don't want to be a fly on the wall on that trip. Hamish and I don't even have to wear pants to work. It's excellent. Is it mainly flooding that stops you? Yeah. yeah. So as long as we stick to the conditions of the contract, everything's fine. The government gives their boss money to run the train. Now that money that they give him is designed to cover all costs involved. So things like the fuel, the diesel for the trip, it'll cost that. It'll cover things like our wages. I mean, hey, you know, we don't come for free. We're employees, so it'll cover our wages. It'll cover any mechanical upkeep that the train needs, servicing bits and pieces like that. It even covers track access fees. Do you got a number of track access fees? You guys pay rego for your car. You know, if you pay registration for your car, that gives you the right, the ability, to use a roundabout 
or an intersection you lucky bugger that's, that's, what, that's what it does, you know, it helps cover the fees for driving around on the road. We don't pay registration for the train in order to use a track, but we need to pay a fee for every kilometre of track that we wish to use. And that fee changes depending on how many other trains use that piece of track, how expensive is that piece of track to maintain, what infrastructure is on that piece of track that needs to be maintained? Like, there's all sorts of factors that come into it that affect that fee. Those of you who were with us yesterday, do you remember we went from Cairns to Coranda? It cost us just over $5,000 to rent the track to go from Cairns to Coranda yesterday morning. Five grand. It's about uh, $157 a kilometre. We've got to pay it easier. Do you remember when we stopped at Coranda at the station? Did anyone use a toilet there? Yeah. It cost us a thousand dollars to pull up and use that toilet. That's why I told you to pee in the sink and do whatever you want, get your money's worth in there. But that's how much it costs to pull up there and to use the facilities at Coranda Station. And every station we pull up at, we get slogged with feet. Every bit of track we use, we get slogged the fee until we get to about Tim Bueller, and then the fee is at the lowest. It's about seventeen dollars a kilometre. After that, so just the track access fee itself, it costs our boss about sixty thousand dollars a month to rent the track off the government to run this train. And now, this is when I start getting confused and my brain starts hurting. I'm not as smart as Amy. The government gives our boss all this money to run the train on their behalf and my boss gets this money and it gives it back to the government so that he can rent the track. Oh, well, what's the bloody point? It just goes around in a circle. But anyway, I'm sure someone gets money out. And obviously there's a little bit of profit worked into that too, so it makes it all worthwhile for the company to do. Now the money that you have paid to be here, the actual rail fare portion of the money that you pay, our boss collects all that and he gives it back to the government. He's not allowed to keep it. He gives it back to them to help them get back some of the money that they gave him in the first place to run this. But the truth is they don't get all their money back. And this train does run at a loss as far as the government's concerned. As far as the company, our company, they make a profit from it, but as far as the government's concerned it costs them money and it does run on a loss. And I know that that is horrible when I say that and people straight away say, oh geez, we're glad I want them here because they'll shut you down soon. But our entire bloody government runs on a loss. If they shut things down because of they run on a loss, we wouldn't even have a government. The government's not designed to, to make money or run up a profit or anything like that. It's designed to provide a bunch of services for the people of this country. One of those services is public transport. Scheduled passenger trains like the Savannah Land, like the Gulf Land, like the Spirit of the Outback, or the trains that run around suburban Brisbane, they all come under that same umbrella. They are a service. And as a service, they're not designed to run at a profit. And there isn't a single government-owned passenger train in Queensland that makes money. They all run at a loss. So you kind of just got to think of them like they're a hospital or the military. You know, these things, they're not there to make money. They're just there to provide a service. And the service that the Savannah Lander provides, I reckon, is a bloody big one. I mean, part of that service is to get you people from point A to point B. Sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, Hamish and I legitimately get locals catch the train to commute. 
we might get some uh, riggers that have finished up at one of the properties for the season. They'll come over, they'll see us, buy some tickets, we'll take them down to Cairns on a Saturday and off they go to get their bottles. So there is that side of the service. People legitimately use the train as a mode of transportation. But obviously tourism is a much bigger part of what we do. And this goes back to what we'll talk about this morning. The whole idea of the train is to bring you guys out here so you guys support the communities, you're supporting the businesses and you're supporting the people that work at these businesses by coming out on the train. But you think about it, you go into a bit more detail and you have a look at the amount of support that you give these communities. It's not just you spending a bit of money out here on accommodation or meals or tours or anything like that. But think about the amount of jobs that you guys have created by coming out on this train. I mean, for starters, I've got a job and Hamish has a job. So there's two blokes that you've given jobs to because you come out on the train. So thank you very much for that. We like our jobs. Very good. Personally, my son finished school last year, he turned 18. The boss rang up in March and he said, what's that lay about Kitty Hall's doing? I said, he's not too sure yet. He said, does he want a job here? Maybe. I pointed him out to you yesterday when we came past the depot. So, Ren, my eldest, has been employed. He's now part of the maintenance team, being trained by a diesel fitter to service the rail motors. So for me, that's good. There's two of my family members, me and my son, that have a job. A couple of months ago, the boss rang up again. He said, oh, what's your partner doing? We need some help in the office with bookings. We're getting too, too popular. So now Mel is in the office doing bookings and answering calls, and helping people with queries and bits and pieces. So in my family, there's three of us. I've only got one more kid. Currently, 75% of my family is owned by the Savannah League. And that's all because you guys get on the train and come in. But not just me, not just Hamish. A lot of people ask who looks after the maintenance of the line. Well, Queensland Rail do that. There's about 24 blokes that are locals, born and bred, and they have been employed by Queensland Rail and trained to the same level any other track maintenance workers trained do to look after the bit of track between Mariba and Fulsom. That is their full-time job. 24 blokes, so there's another 24 jobs that you've just given locals from you guys being on the train. When you think about the jobs that you've created for bus drivers and tour guides, cooks, cleaners, a whole bunch more jobs there. And now with all that employment, it means that people don't just have to work out here, but they can live out here. They can have a family. In fact, some of the people that live out here should probably back off on having a family. They get a bit carried away. I don't think there's much else to do in their spare time. Someone should buy on the TV or something. They get a bit crazy with kids. We've got one bloke who works on the rail bridges. Muzzer, lovely fella. His wife, Caroline, she's lovely too. Muzzer and Caroline have 15 children. 15 bloody children! Their family are... schools. We've got a school at Forsyth, school at Mount Surprise, school at Chilligo. If you're going to have schools, you need teachers, so there's more jobs created. Maybe you need a principal, maybe learning support officers, janitors, a whole bunch more jobs there. Not only that, but 
stupid kids, and sorry Arlo, if you're on board, block your ears mate, you don't need to listen to this, but kids are dirty little buggers aren't they? Dirty bloody things, I've always got a snot nose.
but I know why they give it the name Ironwood because it is an incredibly dense, tough timber, ideal for sleepers. On top of that, it is toxic. Has a really high level of an alkaloid toxin. Termites won't touch the stuff. So you've got this extremely strong, dense timber that is um, termite proof. Perfect for sleepers. The only problem is because it was so tough, it was difficult to work with. And the, uh, the blokes built the track, they never bothered to waste time and energy fashioning those sleepers into a perfect rectangle. We call them hogback sleepers. They chop the trunk straight down the middle and jammed it under the line. So when you come up and have a look at them, you can see them everywhere. They're imperfect, they're wavy, they're round.
big one. Yeah. 
the township of Vinesley would be right here on the banks of the Vinesley River. But the township of Vinesley is on the banks of the Copperfield River, just to confuse us all. So it's a little bit further ahead of us. Are currently parked. 